Okay, we're going to go right into our uh, next work session uh, of importance um, is our fall budget supplemental. Um, Emily, are you going to lead the discussion or we'll go to the manager? Okay, good morning, Council. Um, as mentioned, this is the fall supplemental uh, work session. We do have a hearing scheduled on the 5th to um, consider these items during that time as well. I do have many of my colleagues online, a few here in the room, and Emily, um, our budget director, is here as well, who really uh, leads this process countywide um, and leads her team in supporting all the departments and offices. So we will talk about just uh, quickly a timeline, the recommendations that I'm presenting to council today, the impacts to general fund, where the community and council can see the budget reports and the next steps. For the timeline, um, as all of our supplementals, this is allowed pursuant to RCW 3640. Um, in August, all of the budget supplemental uh, requests were due to the budget office. Um, October 11th is when I finalized the recommendations with um, the assistance of Emily and also from the input from all of the departments and offices. We did meet with everyone to go over their submissions for the supplemental as well as their annual budget request. Today is our work session. And then again, we have a public hearing scheduled for November 5th. As you guys have heard over the last few years, we continue to have growing challenges um, with some of our county funds. And this is not unique to Clark County. Many governmental agencies, uh, the revenues are simply not keeping up with the rising cost. Uh, this is especially true within our general fund. We continue even with those constraints to strive for high quality public safety infrastructure and services in our community. However, we are seeing increased pressures from inflation, rising costs of goods and services, and the demand for public programs and services. Revenue streams such as our property taxes, sales taxes, and other state and federal aid are not growing at the same rate as our expenses. While the growth rate is stable, it's um, certainly being outpaced um, by the cost of goods, inflation, and other areas. Um, that we are balancing with a fiscal responsibility with a commitment to serve our community. Uh, we continue to explore solutions that provide cost saving measures, efficiency improvements, and potential new revenue sources. With that said, without significant adjustments, our ability to provide our ongoing services at a, a level that our community deserves, um, that we will be um, forced to make some very difficult decisions, which we will be making this next year and having intentional policy discussions starting in January on uh, policy priorities as we uh, move forward with the 2026 budget process. In collaboration with the finance team, which includes the deputy treasurer, the budget director, the HR director, finance director, and our deputy county manager, uh, there was a range of strategies that have been implemented to reduce our media expenses and the financial pressures. This resulted in, in several things that council has seen, um, one being a half a million dollars from the exhibit hall revenue, 1.1 million criminal justice uh, counties, 16.2 million for general fund capital projects, and 16 million for ARPA revenue recovery for capital projects. This has been, um, these efforts allow us to actually present a balanced budget finishing 2024, as well as hopefully recommending a balance. Well, we will be recommending a balanced budget for 2025. For the fall supplemental, just as a reminder, fall supplemental really isn't about new ongoing requests. It is really about truing up what has changed, what council has already approved throughout 2024 to ensure that we're balanced as we close the year. We received 141 requests. I am recommending 136 of those for council's consideration. Just as a reminder for budget neutral, these have the grants that come with the expenditures. There's 20 of those. Uh, carry forward are items that were already approved, but not fully expended. So it's carrying forward the unspent amount. Technical adjustments are just like coding things that we need to clean up. 52 items were previously approved, which council has already considered and approved these during the year. 
we have 49 new requests, eight budget interventions, um, and five that are not recommended. And at this time, I'm gonna do um, just a quick highlight of some of the items that are in there. I'm not gonna read each one individually. I will start out with items that are not being recommended. Some are through either not, we don't need it, or we found other savings within a department to um, cover that, like software licenses. Um, the Children's Justice Center had a victim advocate. Uh, the city of Vancouver did not award this for 2024, so they are recommending that we say no for 2024. Uh, the city is still in their end or their biennial budget right now, and so we'll be monitoring that and working with the director for CJC to see how that could impact for 2025 requests. And then finally, a juvenile detention capital project that is not needed in 2024. Sorry. Some of the new items include overtime, specifically for the jail uh, corrections officers, sheriff's office, superior court, and juvenile. Supplies, services, and utilities, as we've seen an increase due to inflation. Uh, Public Works has a series of items that they're truing them up because our budget process starts so early in the year that this is really to capture and identify what has actually happened. This includes like the transportation improvement program, parks and lands capital program, and stormwater capital plan. Uh, this does uh, also include the sheriff's office um, contract that council approved with La Center to provide uh, policing up there. Uh, presidential election uh, year expenses. There is a calculation out there where some of that is reimbursed. Uh, this is a normal um, cost for high uh, level elections in our county. Cost allocations. So th this is like with community development. So it's making sure that the work being performed was allocated to the correct uh, code. The general fund subsidy for planning and code fund. This is an annual um, subsidy, it's usually about 1.3 million a year. Uh, this is to cover things that the fees do not cover, including habitat and land use. You will be having your second work session on that. Um, the fees this afternoon starting at one. And then increases with CRESA 911 system and the Humane Society. Again, the budget interventions that I had mentioned earlier with the capital bonded projects, the exhibit hall and others, so that, that those budget interventions are one time hit uh, to allow us to uh, maximize on revenues and reduce expenses. Carry, for, carry, forward, carry forward items include such as grants, capital projects, um, and thing, other items that have not been fully spent that council's already approved. Previously approved, again, this would be like the repurposing ARPA for the public defense office. We, we changed that around a couple of weeks ago where ARPA is paying for the contracts that we currently have, and then the we'll be reducing that line over time, and we're using general fund for there. So there are some adjustments there. Next slide, please. There are a couple of um, recommendations that came in after we had done um, our presentation and reports. This first one is for district court cases for three hundred thousand dollars. We just learned, I think, a week and a half ago um, from district court that the current rate of case filings and the percentage that qualify for public defense is increasing. They're also forecasting more than 700 cases through the end of the year. Based on the current budget and the contract that we have in place with Vancouver Defenders, district court will be running out of public defense attorneys by November 19th. So this is a one time allocation to make sure that we're coming in through the end of the year within budget and allocating 300,000. I will say our new public defense director, while he doesn't usually manage the day to day for district court, it's really superior court public defense. Um, he has been collaborating with them um, and also Amber Emery, our deputy county manager working with Vancouver defenders to see how we can help solicit attorneys. Um, and get them under contract and get them in front of council because if we don't, the, the judges will be appointing and the cost is considered reasonable and at the judge's discretion. So if we can get people signed up, then we can have that contract that identifies the cost. So the 300,000 will hopefully get us to the end of the year. The second item um, amendment that was not included initially is the increased annual funding and budget capacity for the IT budget. 
by 246,000. This is for Microsoft server licenses. Microsoft just conducted an audit. Um, and so this will cover uh, licenses that we need from June 1, 2024 through May 31st, 2026. We anticipate in 2026, there will be a new three year contract that signed and the cost will actually significantly reduce from where it is today. And I probably need to add um, that's not on this uh, presentation as well. And we just learned this, I think, late last week after this was published is the medical examiner's office under public health. We are also going to be asking to amend to include that one time. I believe it's 400 for 450,000 for medical examiner expenses. We've been contracting out for the last year um, with the vacancies. And so just with the rate of the work being done and those costs, uh, we'll need to include that as well to ensure that we're within budget. Okay, six year forecast. I will go through this and then take a pause to see if council has any questions uh, before we move on. So this is our general fund six year forecast. And does anybody need this blown up? Can you guys see this okay? Okay, I'm seeing, yes, okay. If you don't, I do have a hard copy here. Um, so you can see on here for 2024, the beginning fund balance is 101 million. Revenues are at 194 with expenses at 202 and capital at 300. The capital line is new as we've implemented the capital portion of the budget. Uh, the 2024 budget forecast modifiers, it's um, included about halfway down on there. The assigned fund balance as adopted by council is 23 million. This is for the ARPA revenue uh, recovery projects and the fall supplemental impacts, which is 20.5 with just about 900,000 ongoing. So most of the inf most of the requests today again are cheering up for 2024 and are one time. The ongoing is for salary adjustments. That leaves a projecting ending fund balance of 61 million. Compensated absences are 28 million. And just as a reminder, this is 25% of if people uh, leave the county, they're afforded cash outs for PTO, sick leave, and vacation. So this accounts for 25% of that um, liability, financial liability. The non spendable encumbered invoices are the invoices that we know are coming that have not been paid. That's at 1.7. Um, and then our minimum fund balance of 32.9 million, which is approximately 60 days of operation. As you can see on here, the pink on the bottom in 2026, that is negative. That means we do not have available funding from 2026 on. And I also would like to note that this does not include any requests for the 2025 budget. So as we're going through that annual budget process, um, which I just solidified recommendations um, to budget and we'll be communicating out with all the departments and offices. We have to be very strategic and careful because we're, we're going to tip in 2026. And of course we need a balanced budget for 2025. Um, the available, so for 2026 um, available, oh no, you can see it's 505,000 that we do not have funding. If you go out to 2030, you can see a 62.9 million shortfall. So that's where our policy discussions, it's gonna be a very hard year to try to figure out how to balance in years coming up. It, the one good thing, and we've said this over the last couple of years for with COVID is we got a lot of one-time costs. We had a huge increase in sales tax that's leveled off. It's still projecting to be strong moving forward, but not to have that significant increase. And we had a lot of one-time funding such as ARPA. So that really delayed these tough decisions until now. Um, like I said, the property taxes, all those are looking good moving forward, but it's still um, not enough to cover all of our expenses. I'm going to pause now and see if there's any questions on this from council. So, um, I do have some questions, but Councilor Marshall does as well. Yes, thank you. I had a question on the not, not recommended uh, related to the victim advocate. As, as uh, just 
I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. The city of Vancouver pays for half of that and they're not able to pay for that. And so therefore we're not going to be paying for the other half. Is there, is that still being figured out? I think I can answer that just a little bit. I've had a lot of conversations with um, Amy Russell. So the, the victim's advocate was actually funded through ARPA. And since that funding's expired, the city had committed to doing a um, portion of that payment for another couple of years, and it's being considered for 2025. They're not considering. Sorry, can you hear me better now? Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, so that, that is not being funded for 2024 through the city, but they are still considering funding it in 2025. Okay, so it, it's, it, it was not a position before the opera. ARPA funding became available? Correct. Okay. And uh, so the position then will be vacant between now and the end of this year? It's my understanding that uh, CJC is using existing fund balance to smooth out the rest of 2024 with hopes that the city will um, be able to pick it up. Pick pick it up, up part of that in we should know that within a couple weeks. Okay. Before we go on with your additional questions, I'm not clear on that answer. Was I used to sit and, you know, years ago, there was a lot of fundraising that went on that helped pay for not only the advocate positions, but the interviewer positions. Uh, it was shared. Um, it, there's a lot of shared expenses there because it's a joint project between the sheriff and, the, and VPD uh, to move these cases through the system. I, I also did this for a lot of my prosecutorial time and, and a career uh, focusing with these victims. Very, very tragic. They need a lot of support. These victim advocates and the interviewers are part of the system. When ARPA money came into being, because there was a lot of stress on fundraising that made those positions every year Questionable. Okay, are we are we able to fund it this year or not? Uh, so we, we created the positions on, funded by ARPA as a temporary fix until we could get them to be sustainable. So what I'm advocating for one is these need to be full time positions. They are essential to criminal justice and dealing with these sexual assault victims who are very young and, and vulnerable and impacted for their entirety of their life. And how they get through the judicial process will be a big, a big marker for how they will do for the rest of their life. Uh, so I'm concerned about, I was very concerned when I saw that the city was pulling their funding and then for us to go ahead and pull it too. Uh, I don't know that we have anyone on the council sitting um, on that. Yes. We do. Committee. I think it's Councillor Bowerman, but if I can clarify. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this specific position wasn't their prior positions. This was a project position paid by ARPA um, in which the ARPA funding ends. And like Emily said, it is covered through the end of this year. So it, this particular position was above and beyond what they already had. Um, on a project case, not saying that they shouldn't have it in the future, but um, it is not being recommended with the city of Vancouver. And as Emily mentioned, there's ongoing discussions with the city because that would be a split toss with the county. Um, I don't know if it's a 50 50, but I don't, I just so want to make sure that my this question is not sitting there any longer. What does that leave them? So it still leaves them with one advocate or two advocates or no advocates or a half-time advocate? What are they gonna have left? I don't have the exact staffing positions, but they will still have what they had before the ARPA project positions. So, uh, but we could definitely follow up on that for you. Great, thank you. I'd be, uh, that would be a priority for me as well to make sure that those services are covered. Um, and then I had a question about uh, contracting for the medical examiner. I know we had a discussion about this some time ago uh, and uh, we decided the reality was we had to contract, but I just wondered where it stood in terms of potentially hiring a medical examiner. Yes, so, um, and as you've been told in the past, it's a very small pool throughout the country, like 
just less than a thousand people. I think it's five to seven hundred people who are qualified. Um, the public health has been interviewing. We have two vacancies. We have a chief and we have a deputy. They have interviewed somebody for the deputy. They are not qualified for the chief position and they're going through that process right now. And so they're there may be a person joining. I don't know that it's not been finalized, but they have interviewed about for the chief position. We have not had anybody qualified apply. Thank you. I think that'd be a priority uh, because uh, contracting is so expensive. So it, it, if we keep trying, uh, we will absolutely keep trying. Um, and the salaries were updated with the bigger Tilly, so that should help. But like I said, we're competing across the country for a very small pool. Um, but yes, it's it's always better to have that in house than as a contractor. Right. We're a very livable community, though, so that might help. So I I had my questions were directed um, more to the defense support. Because obviously we're we're still in a transition period to our public defense, and um, I'm very concerned that we're with the influx of additional um, misdemeanor complaints into the system. We're about to hear uh, the foot, the other shoes get a drop from the Supreme Court on what they recommend on caseload limits. Prop four, if it adds these traffic cameras. So we're in a vulnerable period of time. The whole idea of having a public defender is to limit the number of contracts we have. And we still don't have know where that sweet spot will be for a conflicts uh, council contract. But I'm concerned if we don't publish from your office, from finance office, and we have a lot of experience in contracts, what are reasonable rates to pay? I mean, if we get to the point when a judge is appointing, we don't want the court setting those rates. Agreed. We want the county setting those rates, otherwise it won't be sustainable. And then we're gonna be right back into dismissing cases when we don't have defense attorneys. So that's my question and slash suggestion. Do we have a rate scale that we're going to suggest uh, to the courts before they start appointing? Uh, private counsel. And so, and I will say also, this is for district court. So when you're talking about contracts, they work with one contract as Vancouver defenders. Superior court is the contract model that we're trying to bring in house. Um, with my discussion with their presiding judge and their administrator, um, cause I had asked, you know, cause there's also liabilities with judges appointing potentially with challenges to that, um, in the system that they have seen in other counties. We can certainly suggest, but they made it clear to me that and legal was on the call that per RCW, it says reasonable. And so it is how it was explained to me is the defense attorney will present what they believe they should be compensated and each individual judge will take that into consideration and in consideration of that specific case and determine what is reasonable. We can certainly share what the rates are, but they made it very clear it's under the judge's discretion on what the final amount is. It is our best interest to um, acquire attorneys and get them under a contract. And this is just through the end of the year. I mean, we obviously, if it's going to continue next year, we need to, you know, continue to work with them. And, and Christopher has gone, I mean, you just saw a contract um, at our last nighttime meeting that he brought forward because he did talk to somebody who was willing to sign a contract to take cases. Um, and he's continuing. And I know, um, I think her name's Christy Emmerich with Vancouver Defenders is also working very collaboratively to try to find folks that are out side of that original contract to ensure that we have some capacity. So we're doing the best we can to help support them. Um, I also asked district court in the future to uh, let us know a little bit more in advance before they get to this um, position. Um, and I, like I said, I know a lot of work has been going on behind the scenes. They've been talking with Tony Golick, the prosecuting attorney, trying to brainstorm reasonable ways to address the number of cases and the number of folks that are qualified for public defense. Super, thank you for that detailed response. So you're on top of it. Uh, I just, it's outside the budget process, but just I have to comment on it. And I know we have at least one lawyer in the room. Having one 
law firm providing legal services as a single contract is really problematic. There are conflicts of interest even at the, I mean, you don't have a whole lot of misdemeanor multiple defendants, but you have former clients, current clients, informants. You have so many possibilities for conflicts. I, I don't know how we get around that here in Washington state or simply ignore it, uh, having a firm uh, represent with all these potential conflicts out there. So anyway, other questions up until this point? Otherwise, we'll let Kathleen continue. Sure. Please, go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, I just had a, a couple comments, um, you know, and I, I kind of mentioned this when we had approved going out for bonding for some of the capital projects we had, because, you know, my concern then was exactly what we're seeing right now, and that is it has softened the blow. And I don't, yeah, I don't see us adequately addressing the the serious deficit that we have. You know, we bought ourselves some more time, but I feel like now needs to be the time that we're making some of those difficult decisions, so that in 2026 we aren't forced with drastic decisions to make. So, uh, you know, when I look at this, um, I know it's a, a net increase because of those bonds that we issued and the, you know, the event center funds and things like that. But, you know, it, it just, I, I don't feel like we're, this adequately displays the situation that we currently are in. It shows something for the future that we have to deal with, but we're in that situation right now. Yeah, if we didn't do the bonding, we would be cutting. But it is a one time fix and, you know, seeing this. 62 million, even even a half a million in 2026 is. Going to be devastating. Because that does not include anything that's been presented or recommended, or I wouldn't say recommended submitted. For 2025, and we hear the need. For CJC ongoing funding, sheriff's office wants funding. If we don't have a revenue source, we can't pay for ongoing funding. That that is the bottom line, and that that's why in January, I mean, I I give credit to our finance team, to Sarah for leading us through the bond issuance, because if we didn't have the hard work that they have done to really capture revenues. Um, and look, think creatively, we would have been cutting in 2025. And I mean, and that, that just, and, you know, and our general fund departments know it's, it's a hit. And most of that is law and justice. And most of that is people. And I would say, you know, all of them, except for the sheriff's office are countywide services. And they're already strained because unlike other jurisdictions, the county FTE, which is employees has not increased. Since the recession, there's been minimal or reduction in FTE. So everybody's doing a lot more with less, but it people are starting to see it. I think the community is starting to see it and um, decisions that impact us without us having the ability to, you know, without the funding, it's it will be devastating. So I guess the the only thing that I would add to that is it 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 feels to me like it would be a more prudent measure to start cutting this year rather than next year just to soften the impact overall and and it also you know quite frankly will bring more public awareness to the actual you know situation that we're in it just it seems like you know this this little short term fix has just kind of stalled a process that's necessary anyway yeah, and we've done short term fixes for every year for the last few years to get us balanced and until we know what council's prior policy priorities are. It would be me recommending what to cut and I don't think that at this point, I don't think that would be appropriate for the 2025 annual budget process, because I think all the departments and offices deserve to have a public discussion with council regarding those and any potential reductions they need to be everybody needs to be at the table and to have that intentional public discussion like i said which will start in january so um i without direction from council on policy priorities it's it would 
not be a good business practice for me to recommend cuts to departments and offices. Fair, fair enough. I, I appreciate that. Uh, my intention is just to try to elevate the public awareness of the situation that we're in and going to be facing very soon. So, Glenn, I want to comment on your question and comment. So, number one, good luck to you, Sue, and Michelle, and whoever the new counselors are. These six-year forecasts pretty much have always looked the same. Let me say that again. They've pretty much always looked the same. This is worse. This is the worst one I've seen since I've been a counselor. But so you're maximizing because it's an accounting rule. You maximize the potential for for expenditures. You minimize your revenues. Because it's that's prudent conservative accounting. So these are these have always we've always been in a, in a deficit. We've always been in a structural deficit. We always run out of money in a few years. This one's a little worse because we run out of money sooner, uh, even doing this this capital uh, one time fix. So the so you're going to have some tough choices to make, but I want to make two other comments about this. Years ago, my first question was, "Hey, where do we cut?" Where, where are the soft parts in the budget? And the answer was, oh, we're already cutting. There are no soft spots. Now, of course, you as a counselor have no capacity to actually research that. I actually had one counselor from the dais say, well, what, what line items do you want to cut? I mean, there's hundreds of line items. Most of them are by code, and I have no idea what they even are. So that would be throwing a dart at a dartboard. So you as a counselor, without staff to research this for you, you know, what you would consider a low priority or a soft part in the budget, you don't really have the capacity to do that. And otherwise, then you're left with the tool of, well, Let's just do a 10% cut across every department or pick apart department, one that you don't least favor. I mean, you just don't have the capacity to really dig into the budget the way you may want to, to make that hard decision. So on the other side, I want to highlight this because this is what the public needs to know. This is what our governor needs to know. This is what our legislative delegation needs to know. Camas, Vancouver, Clark County, we have, we are hobbled by our tax structure because of tax leakage. That is our deficit. You know, at times, Mark has estimated that up to $10 million a year Vancouver loses, or up to $25 million a year we lose in tax leakage. Now, he's revised those estimates, those forecasts downward, in part because of being conservative, excluding King County as, as a marker, uh, but also online shopping and the pandemic impacted uh, people shopping over in Portland. That is your only saving, saving grace. If we're able to retain some of our sales tax income, we can fix this today. So could Vancouver. It is the one thing that is fixable within our existing Washington state tax structure. Uh, if you can move that issue forward, we are hobbled. Our revenue stream is as much as every county and city complains in Washington state that they don't have enough money. We additionally have this tax leakage issue. So I just want to promote that because the public needs to be aware, shop locally, uh, but we know that's not human nature. We know that's not going to occur and we're going to continue to see this tax leakage and it's going to make your job in the out years harder and harder. Thanks for that paid political announcement. Is there any other questions on the six year forecast? Okay, I'm not hearing any. The, this slide is just showing um, that structural deficit. So the red 
or orange line is our operating expenses and the blue is our revenues. So as you can see in here for 2025, there's 11.1 million um, that it's outpacing, the expenses are outpacing our revenues. And the last two years, we have dipped into one-time fund balance to balance the budget. And that will also be recommended for 2025. So you can see it does grow over the years um, from 11 million to 17 and a half million by 2030. So it was just a different representation of not just the full forecast, but just the simple expenses and revenues. This does include I believe and I'll look at Emily for the expenses, the like increased cost for like that we put in for the forecast, like 3% for salaries um, and then increases for benefits. It does not include the 1% um, per council's request um, historically. And we've continued this with the six year forecast and with this, the 1% in future years is not included in that. Could I just ask a quick question? How much would that 1% be? It's usually about 750,000 per year and that compounds year over year. So like if you do it two years in a row, it's one and a half million and moves on. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, Kathleen, so I didn't catch it if you uh, stated this already. In the line that shows the expenses, are the uh, 2026 and onward uh, expenses that we heard about just a few days ago included? For example, the sheriff's office with their additional um, requests for uh, sworn deputies, et cetera, sworn no, officers. That is not included because that's okay. part of the annual budget request. Um, and so um, everything except for the medical examiner's office, I don't know if the other two amendments were. Okay, so the only piece. Uh, from today in the fall supplemental is the medical examiners for 450,000 that is not included in this. The other amendments and the recommendations are included for the for the fall supplemental. Did that answer your question? Councilor yes, Garman? thank you. Okay. Just to, to add further on that real quick. This also does not include the indigent defense. Issue that's that's being dealt with in the Supreme Court. And it also does not include any impact from prop four if it were to pass. Is that correct? Absolutely, because we don't know what if it one if it's going to pass on both of them um, or what the implementation. Well, we have proposition for implementation that the city has provided us, but obviously not for case standards. So yes, you're correct, Councillor Young. Okay, so the next slide is just um for Council and for the public, you can see all the budget reports for the fall supplemental on the budget website. Um, this includes the line item appropriation for the operating capital, the summary by fund and by request, the staffing changes, uh, which is also requires council approval for moving even FTE from department to department, um, and the change request narratives and a summary by fund. The next slide is also um, is one of those reports and it highlights the specific. Um, change requests that have been rec recommended there. So if you click, and this will actually is also, maybe it's not on the council. Okay, it is also on the council meeting too. So the link for all the details of what is being recommended, what was submitted is online, both on the budget website and the council meeting website. And then finally, um, these, uh, this next slide shows just the other major fund financial impacts. Um, this is also included in the reports that are available online. We tend to focus on the supplementals on general fund because that is our, our one of our larger funds and also with the structural deficit during the annual budget, we'll hit all the major funds on how anything recommended is addressed in their six year forecast. And again, um, I want to thank all the departments and offices, the budget office, the finance team for helping us get through uh, this process. Uh, we're all open to questions. If there's any questions, I know my colleagues are online um, and we have our public hearing on November 5th. And I think that's the last slide. Thank you for all that Kathleen and all the hard work you do and the clarity to which you bring to it. Questions by council. Further questions by council. 
I have a question, Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just going to wait to the end. Um, mine's related to the reimbursable of things for the elections office. Kathleen, what does that include? Are they reimbursed by the state? Oh, um, you're talking about for like the presidential election. So I believe yes. uh, state and cities contribute to those costs. There is a formula for that and we can get that for you for the public hearing, but yes, the, the cities, you know, it all depends on the number of items on the ballot, what jurisdiction it's in, uh, but it does get re a portion of it does get reimbursed to the county. Okay. And I, I was wondering since the ballot box issue, um. Recently happened now they have to staff people around the ballot boxes to. Uh, until the elections and I was wondering how that's going to impact the budget as well. Uh, I'll have to, I know we're using temporary staff and I know elections has a temporary staff budget. Uh, so if. If I find out that we're going to be over and cannot move money from contingency or another aspect, then you'll be hearing about that during the hearing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I had the same concern. I, I would just recharacterize it. We don't have to have people 24 7 sitting on these boxes. Oregon's not doing it. Um, but oh my gosh, I mean, it would be great if we had volunteer organizations watching it. It would be even better if we didn't have people doing these crimes against our democracy. Uh, but yeah, budgeting 24 7. How, how, especially night shifts, is this going to be a huge overtime? I mean, I, I, I don't know how uh, the auditor's doing it. This is, uh, and I, I think there are like 22 locations, roughly 22 boxes out there. I mean, I, when I read that in the paper, I was like, oh my gosh, what's the bill going to be for this? So, yeah, I think we need to find out. Um, well and I'd Chair, ask the public to leave our ballot system alone, please. Go ahead, Michelle. Well, I was just going to mention, Chair, or Multnomah County isn't doing that because they have cameras. We don't have cameras. I would say um, all the right agencies on some of this are at the table and are addressing some of those things, and I'm, I don't want to jeopardize the... Um, the process in which the auditor's office or our local partners in law enforcement, including federal, are doing to help ensure. But there are, yes, there's no permanent ca cameras for all of them, but there, I think there's some actions being taken that will help reduce risk. So did you need any further guidance from us today? Otherwise, we wait for the public hearing. I would say we wait till the public hearing unless the counselor has an amendment and per your rules of procedure, any amendment in a budget process will require 48 hours notice to your fellow counselor. So if there is something in here that you're not agreeing to with a recommendation, um, just let us know so that otherwise the same um, information will be presented on the 5th and we'll follow up on a couple of the questions that were. So let me double tap on that. We have a, a procedural rule change that we did a couple of years ago based on a last minute amendment, which threw the process in quite a bit of disarray. Don't do it. Uh, the only one I'm concerned about is um, uh, the, the advocate. Um, and because I want to know that they're not completely left in the lurch. Um, with Vancouver and us pulling funding. Uh, so that's the only one that I'm and that would be about. addressed in, in the, yeah, that would be addressed in the annual budget because this budget they're, um, good okay. for the rest of the year. Okay. Further comments or questions. Otherwise, do we have another work session or is that do it for this morning? We have 1 at 1 o'clock and then following that will be a council time. So we have nothing further this morning. We'll be back at 1 and then. Did we still have an executive session as well? Yes, there is one executive session. So council time should be pretty light. Um, our treasurer is going to join us under policy updates um, and we'll join Jordan, but um, to share some initiatives she's working on and recommendations. So other than that, um, I am re will be asking to amend the agenda to remove the law and justice next steps uh, due to looking at revenue options and bring that back. So it should be pretty short. Council time following the work session. 
Okay, if there's nothing further, then I'll adjourn these work sessions. Thank you, Emily, and everyone else for joining us uh, this morning.